All right. I'm going to ask those of you getting coffee that to enjoy your coffee and find a seat when you can. I'm John Haig. I am the co-director of the Most of Our Romani Center for Business and Government. Um, we are extremely fortunate today that um, we have with us uh, uh, David Lenhart. And da many of you probably know David, probably have read many of his books or his book and, and his articles. Um, just a little bit of background. Um, he um, uh, writes The Morning, which is the flagship daily newsletter for the New York Times. Uh, he was the he is the author of this book. Ours was the Shining Future, um, and if you haven't filled out a little name tag, throw it in the jar over there. We're going to raffle off five of these at the end of the day. Um, all yours. Um, the thing that I found compelling about the book, and and it's I don't want to take much time on this, but but the first paragraph. The decades into the 21st century, the stagnation of living standards has become the defining trend of American life. Life expectancy has declined. Economic inequality has soared. And the black-white wage gap is almost as large as it was in the 1950s. How did this happen in the world's most powerful country? And what happened to the American dream, the promise of a happier, healthier, more prosperous future, which was once an inextricable part of our national identity? Uh, that's a pretty compelling introduction to a book um, and one which uh, I'm looking forward to hearing David talk about a bit. The actual title of this seminar today is The Class Inversion of Politics, Why Professionals Have Moved Left and Workers Have Moved Right in the U.S. and Elsewhere, but I'm sure he will be happy to take questions on whatever kinds of issues uh, seem to appeal to you. He's been an op-ed columnist at the Times. Um, he has been... Um, Washington bureau chief, he's a podcast host, he kind of does it all, uh, some version of doing it all. And he was a Pulitzer Prize winner in 2011 for his commentary. Um, and he was, um, has been a senior fellow at Yale's University's Jackson School of Global Affairs. And in spite of that, we still invited him to come <laughs> speak here at Harvard and the Kennedy School. Um, so with that, I'm gonna hand it over to David um, and thank you very much for coming. Thank you, John. Um, thank you for having me. Thank you, Dean Elmendorf, for having me. Thank you, President Faust, for being here. Um, I'm really excited to be here. Um, uh, I assumed there would be a, a Yale joke in my intro, so I thought you all would enjoy knowing that at one of the various book events I, I've done, someone came up to me and talked about all the blurbs on the back um, um, and pointed out that there is no one with any Harvard uh, Yale tie despite the fact that I went there and teach there. And four of the six blurbs have Harvard ties. <laughs> so in some ways it feels like I'm at the right place um, to talk about the book. Um, uh, I um, am gonna talk um, fairly specifically, as John mentioned, about one theme from my book, which is the class inversion in politics. I'm gonna focus more on the US than the world, but I am gonna talk a little bit about particularly um, Europe. Um, uh, and um, I'm gonna focus more on the working class moving right um, than professionals moving left. But, um, but I'm gonna leave about half of our time for, for questions and comments and discussion. And I'm happy to talk about any of those other um, aspects during the discussion. I'm also happy to talk about other themes in the book, um, uh, whether it's investment in the future, whether it's labor unions, um, whether it's the role that corporate leadership played in building a more inclusive economy um, in the past and is not playing today. I'm also happy to talk about anything not in the book about the New York Times. Um, uh, I understand sometimes people have complaints about the New York Times. Uh, I'm perfectly happy to hear them. I mean that genuinely. I'm happy to hear any thoughts people have or questions people have about media coverage or the Times particularly. Um, so although I'm gonna be talking about class today, I actually wanna start by talking about race because I find often um, in the United States when you talk about class, people have a hard time not saying, well, isn't this really just all about race? We don't really have a tradition in this country um, the way other countries do, particularly Europe, of talking about class and thinking about class. That has some advantages and it has some disadvantages. And of course, we do have a particular and particularly horrible history with race. And race hangs over so much of American history and American society today that I think that's why when we talk about class, there's often a moment where each of us thinks or someone will say, isn't this really just 
about race. And so I want to go straight there from the very beginning. And I want to talk about the role that race plays, but also the role that I think race does not play in some of the class inversion that we're talking about. And just to be clear, when I say, well, professionals have moved left and the working class has moved right, I'll show you some charts. But what we're talking about roughly is the fact that people without college degrees are much more likely to vote for right of center parties than they were in past decades. And people with college degrees are much more likely to vote for left of center parties than they were in past decades. It's true in nearly every rich democracy in the world. Um, and so, so I wanna talk about, start by talking about race and particularly take you all back to the aftermath of the 2016 election when Donald Trump had just won, which was so shocking to so many people, including the Trump campaign, it did not expect to win. Um, and was, uh, was also quite alarming to many people. And there was a whole discussion of how did this happen and how could this have happened? And there was a series of work that came out, some of it academic from political scientists, some of it journalistic. Often the two would play off each other. We in journalism would write about the research that political scientists had done. And it had one overarching message. And you can see it on the slide below me, which was that the reason Donald Trump won was race. This is a selection of actual headlines from different publications. The middle one is the Washington Post. Uh, the others are from different, different places, but these are quite representative. Um, there would have been similar coverage in the New York Times. Um, and the last one puts it particularly pointedly, time to kill the zombie argument. Another study shows Trump won because of racial anxieties, not economic distress. And so this argument was it was just race. It wasn't class. And I want to acknowledge race clearly played an enormous role in Donald Trump's winning the presidency. Donald Trump during the campaign said multiple racist things, particularly about immigrants. He also had a many decade history of making either racially tinged or outright racist remarks. I in fact made a list. I am 51 years old, I grew up in New York. Donald Trump has been a character um, uh, basically for all of my conscious life. Um, he was a major tabloid character when I was growing up in New York. So I made a list of every uh, statement that I could find that was arguably racist that Donald Trump had ever made, and I published it in the New York Times. So I am well aware of just how important Donald Trump's comments and views about race played in the election. Donald Trump said these many things. He also benefited from a meaningful shift of white voters to him. And I think that's important to say and to acknowledge. The question is, was this one important aspect of why Trump won, or was it the dominant explanation, or even the only explanation? And much of the conversation in the wake of his election argued that it was essentially the only factor that matters. Here is uh, an excerpt from Vox, again, indicative of much more coverage. Um, you'll see the last line, very little evidence that economic stress had anything to do with Trump's victory. So this was essentially an argument that the people who were switching toward Trump and allowed him to win were people who had high levels of racial resentment. This wasn't about any economic stress that they were experiencing. It wasn't about class, it was overwhelmingly at the time that this argument was being made, I was somewhat skeptical of it. I was skeptical of it for at least two reasons. One was that much of the academic work I read, arguing that economic class played no role, I thought conflated absence of evidence and evidence of absence. They would often say, we find no clear correlation between economic class and vote switching to Trump which to me is quite short of saying that economic class played no role. I also thought that much of the argument that it was all about race ignored a lot of other historical evidence. It ignored the fact that this shift of the white working class to the right had been going on for decades before Trump. It ignored the fact that many of the people who voted for Trump had voted for Barack Obama only four years before and voted for him twice. And it ignored the fact that this shift was happening in other countries that did not have the United States' particular history with race and racial oppression. But I acknowledge that if I were standing here presenting the seminar to you in 2017 or 2018, this would have been a murky case. I am not sure that I would have persuaded that many people who didn't already agree with me that class played an important role above and beyond race. 
I think the evidence today, however, has made it much clearer, even clearer in my view than it was seven years ago, that class plays an important role in the appeal of Trump and today's Republican Party to working class Americans. And now I'm going to show you some much more recent headlines. These are probably familiar to you, right? Much of political punditry is now trying to figure out why is it that large numbers of Americans of color are expressing new interest in the Republican Party relative to the past. Since 2018, we have seen a significant shift among Latino Americans, among Asian Americans, and although the shift is smaller, it is noticeable. And if you believe the early 2024 polls, it is quite significant among Black Americans away from the Democratic Party toward the Republican Party. I see no way to explain how this shift is also about the voters being racist. Or if it is, I think the notion of racism loses a lot of its meaning. If you are also explaining the shift of Black and Latino and Asian voters away from the Democratic Party by saying these voters are racist, I think it becomes hard to know exactly what we mean by the term racist. That bottom bullet is from Axios. It's clear from consistent trends across multiple polls that Biden is bleeding support among Hispanic voters and Black voters, especially younger ones, and especially in swing states. It is almost certainly true of Asian voters as well. There isn't as good polling of Asian voters because to poll Asian voters well, and particularly to poll working class Asian voters well, you need to be able to poll in a lot of languages, not just one or not just two languages. This trend is evident in almost any set of data that you look at. This comes from Catalyst, which is a progressive um, firm that does some of the best data analysis. Here I've compared 2014 and 2022, just because I think those were relatively similar elections. They were midterm elections with a Democratic president. If I showed you 2018 to 22 instead, these trends would be identical. The numbers would be slightly different. You can see among all four major broad um, racial groups, ethnic groups in the United States, Democrats have lost support among people who do not have a four-year degree. The shift has been significant uh, among Latino voters and Asian voters and Black voters in percentage terms. It has been smaller among white voters, in part because the party had already lost so much support among white voters. This trend is not evident with college graduates. Um, and to the extent that it is, it is again with non-white voters. So Democrats have meaningfully increased their share of white college voters between 2014 and 2022. Again, the same would be true if we saw 2018 to 2022. This is not simply about Joe Biden. We've seen it in midterms. Um, uh, we've seen it uh, in the presidential election as well. And we see it in polling again today. Um, I'm not sure how well you can see this. It's okay if you can't see it that easily. This um, series of, of tweets by John Byrne Murdoch who is a data journalist at the Financial Times, got a huge amount of attention last week. You may be able to see this tweet got 6.5 million views. Um, uh, and he basically took some of these trends and he continued them through 2024 using polling rather than election results. It got some pushback from people who said, you don't really wanna com compare um, polls with election results. Um, but one of the people who's, who argued that, that the Twitter thread had perhaps overstated a little bit was Lakshia Jain. And I put his on here to note that he says, yes, maybe you overstated it, um, but uh, the trend uh, of voters of color, of younger non-white voters being far less democratic, especially with black voters, is fairly well established by now and is clearly visible. So when we look in the longer term, we see a shift of people without college degrees away from the Democratic Party that in recent, has long been true of white voters, has recently expanded to include American voters of color too. This chart is from my book. This doesn't separate voters by race. Um, it looks simply at college educated voters, which I define as people again with a four-year college degree and non-college voters. On the right, you can see that non-college voters, those huge bars pointing upwards, means that those voters were very heavily democratic relative to the rest of the country. So the biggest bars pointing upward mean that group leans way, way democratic. So at the beginning of the period in the 1950s, you see that non-college voters are extremely democratic. Um, and once you get into the 20th century, you see that they are much less democratic. 
There is a big shock around Trump. Those last two bars are 2016 and 2020. So you do see a big shock among uh, with Trump. But Trump's not the only thing going on. You also see a really substantial movement of working class voters away from the Democratic Party in 2004, when George W. Bush and John Kerry were the nominees. So this is a long standing trend. It is also a trend in multiple countries. This is a chart from a paper by Gethin, Martinez, Toldano, and Piketty. That's Tomas Piketty. Um, uh, and what they do is they look across 21 Western democracies. This is an average of all these countries. The red line is showing what's going on with education. And the fact that the, the red line starts below the access means that originally um, less educated people, I'm sorry, originally that more educated people leaned to the right, and that over time, more educated people go to the left. So being above the axis means that you're to the left. Part of their point in this chart is that this divide has happened much more along educational lines than income lines. So if you want to think about it in a slightly stylized way, a school teacher who has a college degree but doesn't make a lot of income has remained on the left in these countries. An entrepreneur, say someone who runs a carpentry business who doesn't have a college degree, um, has stayed on the right, despite having high income. That's important in Europe, but actually in the United States, the education and the income trends have been extremely similar. So this is the Piketty charts. This is for education, one for each country. You can see all the countries kind of look similar. Less educated people moving to the left, more educated people moving to the right. This is the income trend and it's messy, but the fact that the United States line ends at the top on the axis means that richer people in the United States are no longer to the right of poorer people in the United States. So these three charts I know are a little bit to, to, to take in all at once, but the key thing here is if you're looking at Europe, you do have to grapple with the fact that the income trends and the education trends are somewhat different. In the United States, they're much more similar. We have seen both less educated people and lower income people move to the right and more educated people and higher income people move to the left. The story in the United States is somewhat similar, somewhat simpler than the story in much of Europe. So I hope I persuaded you with these that the class inversion is real and that it is not simply about race. And again, I welcome questions that, that would believe otherwise. Um, I wanna spend the second half of my talk trying to explain why this might be going on. And I'm gonna highlight four factors. I think they're overlapping. I think they're all true. Um, uh, they may not be a complete list and I'm sure there are different, um, different magnitudes to each of them. But the first one, particularly focusing on the shift of working class people to the right is the notion that many people are dissatisfied and when people are dissatisfied, that can destabilize politics. This is, I think, a somewhat familiar story. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it. But for working class people in this country, life has become difficult in many ways. Or maybe to put it more, more pointedly and accurately, life no longer reliably gets better over time the way it did in the past. This is the story I try to explain in my book. In the 40s, 50s, and 60s in this country, material living standards for working class people were consistently getting better. Yes, that was a period of horrible racism and horrible sexism and horrible religious and sexual discrimination, all of those things. It is also the case that despite that discrimination, the black-white pay gap and the black-white life expectancy gap were shrinking in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. So the progress for working class Americans was not limited to white Americans during those period. It was broad-based even as the gaps still exist. In recent decades, by contrast, progress for working class people has slowed enormously. Things like the black-white pay gap have stopped shrinking. Um, you've probably seen charts like this. This is one that ran with a story that I did in the Times. And what it shows is that income for people at the very top has vastly outpaced GDP, while income for people in the middle and the bottom has trailed GDP. Yes, it's still risen. Income is still risen. And you'll see an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal roughly every two weeks pointing out the fact that income has still risen for the middle class and working class. But look how much less it has risen than it has for the upper middle class, um, which I defined in this chart as the 90th to the 99th percentile, a group that may be of particular interest to New York Times readers and people around Harvard. 
Um, and for the very wealthy, um, income has outpaced um, uh, GDP. It is not just economic variables that show this. This is life expectancy in every rich country in the world. In 1980, the United States had a normal life expectancy for a rich country. For most of the 21st century, we have had the lowest life expectancy of any rich country in the world. And as you can see from this chart, it's not particularly close anymore. This shows there's a line for every rich country in the world in this chart. People often look at it and say, well, isn't it just X? And the answer is no and yes. It's not just X, but it is X. Is it guns? Yes. Is it the fact that we did worse during COVID than other countries? Yes. Is it the fact that we have more people die in car crashes than other countries? Yes. Is it the fact that we're the only rich country where huge numbers of people still don't have health insurance? Yes. It's all those things. But some of those things were true even back in 1980. Um, something has changed in the American, in American society in the last few decades in ways it hasn't changed in other societies. Overwhelmingly, this trend is about working class people. So you're now looking only at the United States at life expectancy. We have to do this starting at age 25, because obviously when people are born, we don't know whether they're going to have a college degree or not. So this is life expectancy at age 25, data from Ann Case and Angus Deaton at Princeton. And you can see, even before COVID, life expectancy for people without a college degree had largely stopped growing. So I think this does play an important role. I think people without a college degree have reason to be angry about the direction society has gone. They have reason to be distrustful. That has probably played a role in loosening their attachment to the political party that they were once attached to. I don't think this can be the full explanation because this chart is obviously very focused on the United States and many of these trends are global, but I think it's an important part of what's going on. Second thing I want to talk a little bit about is this notion of redistribution versus pre-distribution. I assume many of you are familiar with the idea of redistribution. Pre-distribution is a newer concept. People often credit Jacob Hacker, a political scientist, with coining the phrase pre-distribution. It's the idea of making changes in an economy so the wages and incomes that people get before taxes and benefits are more equal. So a minimum wage is a pre-distribution policy. Labor unions are a pre-distribution policy. Trade is a pre-distribution policy. Taxing the rich and giving benefits to lower income people is a redistribution policy. We often kind of conflate these two things and imagine that they're the same. But actually, when you look at public opinion, they are very, very different. There's a new paper out by Kuzemko, Longwe, Marx, and Nadu, um, called Compensate the Losers. And what they point out is that working class people have a strong preference for an economy with more pre-distribution, and higher educated people have a strong preference for an economy with more redistribution. And I actually think both of these preferences come from the same thing. We all want the respect that comes from making a good wage. And if we're upper income, we'd rather make more money and then give some of it away through taxation. If we're lower income, we'd rather make a good wage on our own rather than making a very low wage and have the government bestow benefits on us. I think one of the most important contributions of this paper is they point out how much the Democratic Party's view toward pre-distribution and redistribution has changed. As they say, attitudes have remained remarkably similar since the 1940s, but the Democratic Party has very much moved away from pre-distribution and toward redistribution. The Democratic Party used to be deeply skeptical of trade and in favor of trade restrictions to protect American jobs. The Democratic Party used to be much more in favor of labor unions. Um, the Democratic Party used to be more in favor of strong federal action in order to employ people like the New Deal. Um, increasingly, the Democratic Party says all those policies are doomed, they can't exist in a modern economy, but we can compensate the losers. Um, and many of the people who are dubbed the losers in this frame don't particularly like it. And what this paper argues is that the movement of working class voters away from the Democratic Party in the United States matches up extremely well with the Democratic Party's shift from pre-distribution to 
to redistribution. If there is one thing that I'm mentioning today that I recommend you read besides my own book, it's this paper. Um, uh, it's, it's fascinating and I think important and um, I hope gets more attention. I'm gonna try to give it some attention in the Times soon. Um, I think it's a really important way to think about what's been going on. This is a quote from the paper. Reports of the death of class politics have been exaggerated. Their argument is that there still is a class politics, but the center left party in the United States, the Democratic Party has moved away from the kind of class politics that appeal to lower income people. At the same time that the Democratic Party has arguably moved right on economics, and I think it's fair to consider a shift from pre-distribution to redistribution as moving right, it has moved left on many social issues. It has moved far to the left on immigration. One of the things I document in my book is the history of progressive skepticism of very high levels of immigration. Civil rights leaders were very skeptical of high levels of immigration. Union leaders were very skeptical of high levels of immigration. Advocates for recent immigrants were skeptical of high levels of immigration. The Democratic Party was very skeptical of high levels of immigration. You can find this as recently as Barack Obama. You can find it as recently as Bernie Sanders, who in 2015 said, there's a reason that CEOs keep talking about comprehensive immigration reform. Uh, and I think he may have done air quotes around comprehensive immigration reform when saying it. There's a reason why CEOs are interested in comprehensive immigration reform. And I don't think it's because they're deeply concerned about the plight of the undocumented. I think it's because they wanna keep workers' wages down. The Democratic Party has moved almost entirely away from this view of immigration, although we now see it tacking back toward it with the recent bill that the bipartisan group agreed to and Biden said that he would like to sign. The Democratic Party has instead argued that immigration is essentially a win-win, that it is a free lunch, that it benefits people coming, and that it benefits people in this country as well. The 2020 Democratic Party platform on immigration talks almost exclusively about ways to allow more people into this country and says almost nothing about border security. Now, I understand there is a strong normative argument in favor of letting in many more people to this country. Immigrants who we let in do well, they tend to do better than they were doing in their country, but there are also effects for people who live here. And when you look at public opinion, it's clear that most Americans are not in favor of much higher levels of immigration, particularly working class Americans. I think immigration is a really good example of the kind of issue where the Democratic Party has lost large numbers of working class people by moving toward the policy preference of more highly educated people, which is extremely high levels of immigration. This is a trend that the Piketty paper talks about happening in all of these countries, which is center left parties have moved meaningfully to the left on these social, socio-cultural issues, and they really emphasize them to the exclusion of economic issues. So um, this is, it is, the environment, it is migration, it is gender, it is education, and it is merit. They're talking about all advanced democracies here. I'd add a few other examples in the United States. I think the left in the United States has become very uncomfortable talking about patriotism. When you look at surveys, there's only one large group of people by party and education who don't say the United States is the best country in the world. It's Democrats with a four-year college degree. Democrats are very uncomfortable with the idea of American greatness. This is a new phenomenon. Progressives of the past talked at length about American greatness. Civil rights leaders carried huge American flags on their marches and their racist opponents did them a big favor by holding up Confederate flags. To be on the side of the United States and on the side of patriotism is usually a really good way to win political arguments in this country, much, of the educated left, what Piketty and his co-authors call the Brahmin left, have become uncomfortable with that. It's obviously true about religion as well. The secular left is uncomfortable with ideas of religion. That's why it's called the secular left. Most Americans remain significantly more religious than highly educated Democrats do. I find COVID to be a particularly helpful example because so many of these other issues play into long running debates that we've been having in this country for decades or generations. COVID was a brand new issue 
And COVID was an issue in which large parts of the left had a very strong view that we needed to shut down society for as long as possible. And to do anything other than to do so was actively harming people. Many Americans had a different view. There's a group called Equis, which is another good progressive research firm. They tried to figure out why Latinos in Texas had moved to the right in 2020. Um, they highlighted two main issues. Um, Latino voters were more concerned about border security than many Democrats were in Texas, and Latino voters wanted to reopen um, the economy and society more quickly than many Democrats did. On issue after issue, these sociocultural issues, the Democratic Party has ended up in a place that is out of step with majority opinion, particularly among working class voters. And politics has become increasingly dependent on these cultural issues rather than on economic issues. And I think that also helps explain why we see this trend spanning racial groups. Many of these issues are not simply about race. COVID was not simply about race. Here is um, uh, a poll, US, this is nationwide, people's views of immigration policy. It's a Fox News poll, but Fox News actually does legitimate polls, I promise you. Pollsters at all kinds of places trust Fox News polls. How they then describe it on the air on Fox News is a different issue. But you can see, let's just say, if you, if you, if you operate in certain realms that all of us may, may mostly operate in, these, these are not the opinions that you normally hear um, uh, over lunch and dinner. Uh, with your friends and peers. These are majority opinions in the United States. Uh, Americans, like people in almost every country in the world, um, are in favor of very substantial border security. This is specifically looking at Hispanic voters. Um, and I think this is interesting because it shows both the role that race does and doesn't play. So Hispanic voters are much more supportive of the Democratic Party on immigration um, than white voters are. But immigration is still a relative weakness for the Democratic Party among Hispanic voters. 37% of Hispanic voters, and this is from a couple years ago, so this is even before the issue was as salient as it was now. 37% of Hispanic voters say they trust Republicans more to deal with Ill illegal immigration than Democrats, and 29% say they trust Republicans more to deal with legal immigration than Democrats. This is a chart by Lee Drutman, who's a political scientist, that puts all Americans on two axes. Two axes. One is kind of sociocultural and one is economic. The top right quadrant is people who are conservative on both social and economic issues. The dots are colored by whether they voted for Trump or Hillary in 2016. So not surprisingly, that top right quadrant um, are people conservative on both issues who overwhelmingly voted for Trump. The bottom left is people liberal on both issues who overwhelmingly voted for Hillary. The bottom right quadrant is the quadrant, I'm, as I said, I'm 51 years old. The bottom right quadrant is when I was in college in the 90s, people like to go around talking about how they were socially liberal and fiscally conservative. That is the least popular quadrant in American politics. Um, the top right, top left quadrant is take your, get your hands off my Medicare and off my guns. Uh, it's socially conservative and economically progressive. You can see that is the battleground in which American politics are fought. Um, that is a huge number of working class voters. It's a huge number of voters of every race. Um, and you can see it's got lots of red and lots of blue. Um, by moving right on economics and left on sociocultural issues, the Democratic Party has been on the wrong side of working class voters with both of those issues. Sometimes people question this chart, so I've added another, which is done by a different group and shows the same thing. If you're a political science and want, scientist and want to ask about how these axes are, axes are defined, I'm happy to come back. To you. The fourth and last um, point I want to uh, mention, possible explanation, are the idea of peer effects. And specifically the idea that many voters of color are much more conservative than the Democratic Party. Um, and they have historically voted for the Democratic Party for reasons not of policy alignment, but for other reasons. This is a book by Ismail White and Cheryl Laird. This is two quotes from an essay they wrote connected to it. Although committed to the Democratic Party, African-Americans are actually one of the most conservative blocks of Democratic supporters. Since the 60s, Blacks have become increasingly more moderate and even conservative on a number of important political issues, including certain racial policies. 
The same is obviously true of Asian American voters and Latino voters, whether it's on issues like education, whether it's on religion, whether it's on immigration, as I already mentioned. So although they are focusing on black voters in this book, it is true broadly of working class voters of color. One of the things that seems to have happened recently is this historical loyalty has been weakened. Here's another tweet from John Byrne Murdoch's recent tweet thread pointing out that a much a declining share of voters who identify as conservative are voting for the Democratic Party in each of these groups. So when you think about an Asian American who identifies as conservative, that group used to be overwhelmingly Democrat, it is now becoming less so. That is a trend that feels like it absolutely has the potential to continue. And so that we shouldn't think that the shift among voters of color and particularly working class voters of color to the right is something that's just gonna snap back in a couple. I am sure there are other possible explanations for it, but I think each of these four play a role. And I wanna close by just talking about something that I think is a, a bit of a uniting factor. When we think about the explanations for why working class people shifted to the right that were so popular after Donald Trump's election, I think many of those explanations were fundamentally disrespectful of working class people. And I think more broadly, many of the explanations that you hear for why working class people have shifted to the right are disrespectful of those voters. You will hear things like, well, they just did it because they are racist. That was the explanation that we heard after 2016 or they did it because they're irrationally voting against their economic interests. How many times have you heard that? Why is it that working class people vote against their economic interests? We could ask the same thing about highly educated professionals, right? Why is it that people in Aspen, Colorado and on Martha's Vineyard vote for Democrats, even though the Democrats are gonna increase their taxes? All kinds of people vote against their economic interests. It's not necessarily irrational to do so. Whether you buy four of my four explanations or one of them. Um, I would ask you when you think about what is behind this trend to think about explanations that fundamentally treat voters with respect and say maybe they are shifting because the Democratic Party has moved away from them or maybe they are shifting because they have an understandable prioritization of a religion over tax policy. I just think our politics would be much better if we imagined that people all around are deserving of respect for the actions they're taking, rather than simply saying, you are doing that because you are ignorant, you are doing that because you are hateful. And I think there is a particular lesson there for the Democratic Party. For the Democratic Party to do better with working class voters and put together a governing coalition, a coalition that has a chance to protect reproductive rights, a coalition that has a, protect, a chance to protect LGBT rights, a coalition that has a chance to deliver meaningful improvements in people's, work, people's living standards, even if they're working class. I think putting together that kind of coalition requires having fewer issues where the political left in this country looks at people and judges them and tells them they are wrong and has a longer list of issues in which the left says, we may disagree on this aspect or that aspect, but we agree about fundamental values and we should be part of the same coalition. And so I think in diagnosing this move of the working class away from the left, I think there is also something of a solution for progressive groups to build a larger coalition than they have had in the past. And in a time when politically conservative parties are showing an alarming affinity for authoritarianism, and alarming hostility to democracy, I think it is particularly important for parties on the left to try to build a bigger tent that can protect democracy. Thank you all for coming. Looks like we have two microphones. Yeah, if you have questions, just go, you can go up to the microphones. Um, and I don't know if you have questions. Sure. Hi, my name is Russell DeGraff. I'm a Shorenstein fellow here at the, at, the, at, the, at the Kennedy School this year. I wanted to ask about the, um, the role of media and low information voters, a subsect of, um, of many of the voters that I've understood from focus groups of the, the shifters who have voted Democratic in the past and, and, um, and potentially Republicans in, in, in recent elections. And what is the media's obligation to help the, the voter understand that 
Right now, I think there's two thirds who have no idea that the Congress did anything on climate. Um, many voters have no idea who to blame for where student loan policies are today and couldn't explain them, but know that something happened. Um, and your reproductive freedom and don't understand how the, so what is the media and particularly the New York Times' role to help educate those voters and, and other non low information voters? I think the New York Times' role is limited. Um, uh, no, I'll, I'll ask, no, 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 but I, I wish it were, were less limited, but I think the New York Times' role is limited. We've reported on all those things. We've written thousands of words about all those things. The New York Times has always been a publication that has a, a predominantly elite audience. Um, uh, we now have many of our, much of our coverage on the biggest issues free, available to anyone. Um, but I don't think we uh, ever have been the mass provider of information that's gonna help low information voters. And I don't think we ever will be, no matter how hard we try. I think the solution is likely to lie much more with local journalism, where there is a much bigger crisis. The New York Times is fine. We have 10 million paying subscribers. If we mess up and someone um, dethrones us, there's a business model there to be a national publication for a set of high information voters. That's who's gonna pay for things like it. I think the problem is, is that lower information voters used to get their news from the nightly news, um, which is never coming back, um, and from local newspapers. And um, local, the disappearance of local newspapers is a huge crisis for democracy. And I think trying to come up with a model, whether it's philanthropy, as some very smart people are doing, or business, um, uh, which would be great to have profit-making local organizations, I think that is really where it's deeply important um, for, for people to put their attention. I'm happy to offer some self-criticism of the New York Times. I just don't think almost by definition, we're going to be the, the place that serves low information. I, I can understand that. I mean, but the New York Times couldn't even understand the George Santos race before that. I mean, all that information was public and then in, in op opposition reports that was handed to the paper and others could have potentially solved that particular race before yes. You know, so, I mean, it's just, I, I just want to make sure that the, that the Times is understanding its ability to potentially help shape people's in, in information diets. Yes. I'm, look, I'm very, I didn't do any of these. I'm very proud to work at the place that exposed Harvey Weinstein. Yeah, no, 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 I'm no. I'm very no, proud no, to no. work at the place that has done all this. We also make mistakes, and George Santos is a good example. Right. Thanks. Thank you. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I had a question of uh, reverse causality. So you've painted a very convincing picture that, class inversion of politics has been driven by a shift um, in the Democratic um, Party and their beliefs. But has there also been a class inversion of the politicians, for example? So um, when you talked about the Democratic Party shifting from uh, redistribution to, uh, sorry, from pre-distribution to redistribution, it struck me that maybe there has been a change from, you know, there aren't as many working class people in the Democratic uh, parties. And I was curious if you, you could comment on that, yes. whether there's any... It is absolutely true. And actually, um, uh, I'm now not remembering whether it's the Kuzemko pre-distribution paper or the Piketty Brahmin left paper, but one of those specifically says that there used to be more Republicans in Congress with Ivy League degrees than Democrats with Ivy League degrees, and now it is flipped. So it absolutely is the case um, that um, uh, that the, the people who are the politicians um, embody the shift and may be um, contributing to it. And it's why I think that Democrats who show an ability to win working class votes, um, not to the exclusion of college graduate votes, are particularly important. Barack Obama um, did remarkably better with working class voters than either John Kerry or Hillary Clinton, the two Democratic nominees on either side of him. Um, so there's something in Obama's approach that seemed to work better. Um, Joe Biden has done pretty well with those voters. In fact, it's really hard to get elected president without doing well with those voters. So Joe Biden, Barack Obama, Bill Clinton, all have done fairly well with those voters. Biden's a particularly interesting example because it's black working class voters who almost certainly allowed him to become president by voting for him so strongly in the South Carolina primary, right? That was an example of a moderate group of Democratic voters saying, we want that person to be our nominee, not that person. The, the second person was Bernie Sanders. Um, uh, and so um, it absolutely is the case. And then you have people who are a little bit less prominent, but also quite interesting. John Fetterman, Amy Klobuchar, Raphael Warnock, all these candidates um, um, do better with working class voters when you kind of dig in to the county level data um, uh, than a lot of other Democrats. Thank you.
Hi, uh, thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, my name is Damien, I'm a PhD student. And um, you've talked a lot about how the Democratic Party has moved, say, um, left on social cultural issues or right on economic issues. I'm wondering if you could do the same analysis for the Republican Party. Has the Republican Party moved and moved especially to, to capture those disenfranchised Democratic voters? Yeah. Thank you. So Trump was was did so many things that that were really hard to look away from, like all of the racist statements that I referred to before, that it was sometimes easy to miss some of the other things that Trump did. And Trump in his rhetoric moved the Republican Party well to the left. Now, he didn't govern that way for the most part, but in his rhetoric, he moved the Republican Party well to the left. He expressed a skepticism about trade and actually did kind of govern with a skepticism about trade that absolutely would appeal to people who like pre-distribution, right? He talked about how terrible NAFTA was, right? He talked about how we've been had by all these other countries. He did not talk about Social Security and Medicare the way Mitt Romney and Paul Ryan had talked about it, right? He, he kind of tried to avoid it and suggested that he's all in favor of them. And so we do see among Republicans at least a rhetorical attempt to appeal to more of these working class voters. You also see it in some of the senators, right? You see it, listen to what the kind of things Marco Rubio and Josh Hawley and, and Tom Cotton and some of these other Republican senators now say, they, they don't really sound like Reaganite Republicans. Now, people also often say, but do they ever vote that way? And they don't really ever vote that way on big issues so far, but they did vote for a meaningful number of Republicans did vote for Biden's infrastructure bill and did vote for the CHIP Act. And I'm not sure that that would have happened a decade ago. Some of that is Joe Biden deserving credit for being a very good um, uh, putting together of bipartisan coalitions, better than I expected. Um, but some of that I think reflects some, some changes in the Republican Party. This is a big source of tension for the Republican Party, right? Because their donor base um, uh, and huge important parts of the party, um, like the Supreme Court, show no interest in this sort of populist conservatism, but it's very much where the voters are, and it's going to create some real tensions for the party. Tasha, and I'm a MPP student, and I, I wanted to kind of ask a little bit, somewhat similar to that last question about, so when you, you talked about how um, how the Democratic Party has kind of emphasized the cultural issues at the expense of economic ones. My sense is that's sort of what the Republican Party does as well, or at least in a reactionary sense to Democrats doing that. So um, in in that, but then there's still like what you've talked about, this discursive idea that Republicans are better for the economy. So I'm wondering if you can kind of unpack what shapes voter perceptions on who's better for the economy. Yeah, it's not. Um, the pre-distribution paper does talk about this. And it's interesting because um, working class people used to think the Democratic Party was better for the economy many decades ago. And Obama very skillfully, briefly flipped it, um, uh, in part by saying, um, for the for years, Democrats had, had, had said, yeah, the other party is going to give you a bigger tax cut, but it's irresponsible. And Obama actually offered the middle class an even bigger tax cut than McCain had. Um, I think these views of, of which party are, are better for the economy are really hard to make perfect sense of, right? I think they're really mixed. I also think they're often quite short term. And so the fact that the economy was pretty good um, under Trump before COVID and the fact that we still haven't gotten back to the to the pre-COVID norm, I think plays a role in some of these, in some of these poll numbers we see now. But the same tensions that are created for the Republican Party be between their kind of donor class and, and what has become their base, I do think offers Democrats an advantage. And I think you start to see Biden trying to do this in his early campaign stuff, which is not painting Republicans as threats to democracy as we know it, which can move some voters, but I don't think is necessarily gonna move low information voters that we were talking about before. But to paint Republicans as they're the friend of the rich guy, uh, and I'm the friend of you and your family. And I think Obama did that incredibly successfully in running against Romney, right? They, they had to decide, were they going to paint Romney as someone with no convictions and a flip-flopper, or were they going to paint him as a hardcore um, Bain Capital, job cutting ogre. And they went with plan B and they did it really, really well. 
And if you think about Trump is very hard to run against, but if you think about kind of running against Trump a little bit more like he's a friend of the rich guys and a little less as evil orange haired guy, my guess is that that might be more successful with low information voters. And there is even Luigi Zingales, who's a professor at Chicago, has written an op-ed about this. He wrote it as soon as Trump won. He said, the way to combat guys like him, I've seen it in Italy with Berlusconi, don't treat them as sui generis. Treat them as yet just another politician and talk about how they are failing ordinary people. That's the only strategy that ever worked against Berlusconi. Hi, I'm Kelly. I'm a first year MPP student here. Um, I have a question about the role of money in politics in this shift. You mentioned briefly Republican donors and differentiating from Republican base voters. And I'm curious if the Democratic realignment and shift in policy views has anything to do with trying to attract a more lucrative donor base in highly educated moderates to left voters. I think it probably does. I also think it's hard to know exactly as a previous question asked, which is cause and which is effect. Um, uh, I think one of the things I talk about in the book as an example of how much grassroots politics can accomplish, I think we've gotten too cynical about grassroots politics. I think grassroots politics remains enormously powerful. It explains the incredible progress on, on LGBT rights much more rapidly um, than those of us who are old enough to remember when gay marriage wasn't legal ever expected. Um, it explains all kinds of things. But there is a slight, slightly more cynical take on that, which is some of those issues, and in particular LGBT rights, that is an issue in which very rich progressive donors were entirely comfortable in a way in which they're not entirely comfortable with, say, making it easier for people to join a labor union. And so I do think that, um, that money has played a role in this. Um, but I also think that we sort of have no choice but to try to create a better politics. And we still do have elections, right? And, and we have discovered in a whole bunch of recent elections that having more money than the other candidate is not a guarantee of victory. If it were, no one would be worried that Donald Trump was gonna become president again because Joe Biden has so much more money than him. So money and politics are important, but I also think um, other factors can, can sometimes counter. Thank you, David, for your illuminating talk. My name is Hong. I'm a lecturer here. My question about, toward the end of your talk, the solution may be building a bigger tent, a wider coalition for the uh, democratic liberal movement. And poignant example you gave was COVID during the lockdown. There was a consensus, and you didn't necessarily include a lot of people, or a majority of the Americans. Do you think, is it possible for American voters and the citizenship to believe that the Democrats can deliver on more hands-off government, a more kind of non-controlling, you know, don't game all my private life government. I think it should be. Um, I mean, uh, I, I, I think it also depends a little bit on the issue, right? I, I, I think to come back to that, um, to come back to this chart that I like so much, right? I actually think on a whole bunch of economic stuff, um, people do want the government to play a pretty significant role, even if they want it to be a, a kind of slightly veiled role, right? But people really do want, I mean, it's really interesting to think about when the minimum wage has gone on the ballot, even in red and purple states, it often wins, minimum wage increases. When Obamacare expansions have gone on the ballot in red and purple states, they often win. And so I think it's part of it is thinking about what are the ways in which voters do want the government involved uh, in things and others are ways in which they don't want uh, the government involved in, in their lives. People want a kind of complex mix of, of both. Many of the social issues that you, that you identified, at least some of them like immigration and meritocracy, they kind of seem like they're also economic issues. And you can see that in the way that Biden has talked about climate, where it's like, you know, social, but it's also very much economic. And um, how do you see, how do you see, it seems like that's maybe the terrain for the Democrats to play in, or, or like, how do you see that kind of fusion being something that splits these social and economic groups? The, the, the subject that um, made me most nervous in my book was the chapter on immigration. Um, uh, 
because I worried that people would say that I was anti-immigration. Um, and, and like many Americans, I think of myself as extremely proud of our history as an immigrant country. I, I also think it's the chapter that I learned the most writing. Um, uh, and, um, and it's the one that I've heard from readers, I think that people said they learned the most from. And I've spent a lot of time thinking about immigration since then. And it's why I wanna use it to answer your question. I think when you think about immigration as an economic issue, I would argue that a policy of more immigration is often moving to the right. The same way that Bernie Sanders quote suggests, right? You're talking about a larger pool of available workers, um, which provides more uh, economic competition it really is a neoliberal policy, right? We should allow capital to move around the world. We should allow people to move around the world. We shouldn't have regulations that stop people from doing what they actually want. And so when you think about immigration from an economic perspective, a policy of more open borders, I actually think is more conservative or more liberal in the classically European sense, more to the right. But socially, it's certainly come to be seen as um, a right-wing position. Right. And so I, I think as you're talking, as you're saying on a bunch of these issues, the divide between economics and culture, it's not binary. It's complicated. Um, uh, and it a little bit relates to the previous question. It's not that voters are consistently left wing on economics and consistently right wing on cultural issues. It's that they have a very complicated mix of views. But I think one of the mistakes that the left in this country has made is basically saying to people, this set of views on this issue are okay, and this set, of, this, this set of views are outside the bounds of respectable opinion. And I think when people hear that, it can, can really turn them off. Hi there. Uh, I'm originally from Sweden, and in Sweden, uh, the biggest leftist party is very intertwined with the unions. Yes. And I'm very curious to hear your opinion about how the Democrats could leverage the union a bit more. I know that they've been approaching them a bit more and whether you think they will get even closer and will be, be able to leverage the union better. I think unions are incredibly important. I think um, when I give my standard talk about my book, it has a chart of, of um, the percentage of, of income going to the bottom 90% and the percentage of workers in unions. And the two things move with remarkable consistency over the last 80 or 90 years. Um, and there's all kinds of reasons to believe that's not a coincidence, right? <laughs> Including both academic research and logic. Um, so I think unions are incredibly important. Um, one Democratic president after another has promised to pass labor law reform. And one Democratic president after another hasn't done so. Um, LBJ was famously skilled at getting Congress to do what he wanted. There was only one part of the great society that he didn't get passed. It was labor law reform that would have made it easier for people to join unions. Jimmy Carter had to decide, did he want the Panama Canal Treaty or labor law reform to be a top priority at one point? He chose the Taft Panama Canal Treaty over labor law reform. Barack Obama and Joe Biden didn't have the vote, so I don't blame them, but they both insisted they were in favor of labor law reform. Uh, both of them have passed some amazing legislation. They haven't passed labor law reform. And so the good news is that it's not as if we've tried labor law reform and it just doesn't work. It's not as if we passed a big federal bill like Obamacare or like Biden's climate law and tried to make it easier for people to join unions and it just didn't work in our modern economy. We haven't tried it. And so I actually think that in a service economy, it should be in some ways easier to help people join unions. If I operated a factory down the street and you organized a union there, I can move that factory to Alabama or I can move it to Mexico or I can move it to Malaysia tomorrow. If I operate a Starbucks, or an Amazon distribution center that serves Eastern Massachusetts, or a hospital, and you organize the workers there, well, I can't move my Starbucks to another country and still serve um, the affluent coffee drinkers of the greater Boston area. And so there are ways in which a service sector economy should be easier to organize. I think that some of the new interest uh, and the union victories we've seen over the last year are important. But I don't think we're going to see some huge surge in Americans joining unions until we change the law. So it is not so easy for an employer to basically get rid of everyone who's trying to organize a union and pretend they're doing it for other reasons, or not even pretend and pay a tiny little fine that American law calls for. And unions are imperfect. I've been in a union. 
It frustrated me. I tell, I tell an angry story in the book about what happened when one of my kids needed, needed surgery and how difficult the union was. I'm a manager at the New York Times who manages unions. Unions are imperfect. You know what else is imperfect? Corporations. And when you have imperfect corporations that are not checked by imperfect unions, you get the kind of high inequality economy we have today and we had 100 years ago. I know we're getting close out of time, but I want to take all the, I can do it as lightning round. Hi, my name is Alice. I'm an MPP1. Thank you so much for coming here to speak with us today. Um, I think when you brought up the example of COVID and people's different perceptions of it, and as I was listening to your talk, I was wondering to what extent, if any, do you think the information silos that the elite and professional um, like voters now who tend to vote Democratic is like contributing to this kind of issue where they're, we're losing more and more working class voters because of, I guess, like this sentiment of everyone, like you think everyone agrees with you, but then in that sense, it's, you're actually leaving a lot of people behind. So the tent is getting smaller. Like, how do you see that being a, an issue and how can we remedy that? Like the, as you know, the demographic of people reading the New York times is also a specific demographic too. So yes. How do we resolve that? Yes. Um, uh, so I, I'll answer that with some, with something of a personal story. So uh, as some of you may know, but I'm guessing most of you don't, I had a particular role in, in the COVID debates because um, in my writing, I started very um, hawkish about COVID, um, writing very positively about restrictions. Um, uh, I have a 15-year-old daughter. You'll be shocked to hear she likes to make fun of me. And so given the turn that history took, her favorite photo is me, double masked outdoors. <laughs> um, uh, uh, and once vaccines became available in particular, um, I came to question a lot of the arguments for extended mask mandates. Um, I came to question a lot of the arguments that you can still get COVID outdoors and thus, um, that, that was even before, man, that was even before vaccines. I came to question that how long schools were shut down. The evidence that I was seeing to me made me think that many of these policies were counterproductive and were doing relatively little to stop the spread of COVID and were actually having really bad effects, particularly on vulnerable people. Um, uh, if you think of disabled people um, who can't easily go out for a walk in their neighborhood, many of them belong to social groups that were essentially shut down during COVID. Um, and so they had no social interactions. Um, students for whom learning to read or learning to speak is hard, um, having everyone in school have masks on is not so great. Um, the schools that were closed the longest were often the schools serving lower income and disproportionately students of color. And I wrote many of these things. Um, and I received a lot of real anger on social media um, in a way that I'd never experienced before, certainly never before from the left. Um, some of it pretty vicious. Um, and I would tell you from that experience um, that it's not fun. I didn't take any pleasure out of it, but it's also okay. And um, my experience of trying to step out of my own bubble, um, whether you think I was right to do so or not, um, that would require another hour to talk about. Um, I feel very good about the role that I played. Um, but whether, whether what it, whichever way the story ends up turning, I would argue that stepping out of your own information bubble and asking um, your own tribe, as it were, to interrogate some of their own beliefs is, is okay. Um, and so to, to any of you who are worried about information bubbles and worried that everyone is just singing from the same playbook, what I would ask you to do is spend less time thinking about the, the way the other side is wrong. If you're conservative, spend less time thinking about how liberals are wrong. If you're progressive, spend less time thinking about how conservatives are wrong. And honestly ask yourself, what is a view of my tribe that I think is wrong? Um, and interrogate that view. And I think one of the best ways, no one of us can pop these information bubbles, but each of us can play a little role. And I actually, through my own experience of doing it, um, found it to be not always a pleasant experience, but actually ultimately a very rewarding experience. And it reminded me that when we are sending information out, it doesn't say anything different from what everybody's already hearing. We're having no impact whatsoever on the public debate. And it's only when we're asking people to grapple with their own beliefs in ways that they may not have done so before can we possibly influence the debate.
So you're highlighting a very real problem. <laughs> I'm not denying the problem at all, but I also think um, we can each do a little bit on it. And that's not why I started writing the COVID stuff that I did, but it left me thinking um, that uh, if I am faced in that situation again, uh, I will have less hesitation uh, than I did last time about doing it. Hi, Gene Kimmelman. I'm a fellow here at Mosvar Romani. Um, so observation in my lifetime, I feel like I've seen the greatest decline in the role and the power of corporations in American politics, maybe even in the money side as well. And I'm curious, as you were looking through all these trends, if you see any particular trend or example of how corporate America has shifted what it has done and how it's perceived in the American System. How do you think corporations are less powerful than in the past? Well, in the sense, in the sense that I see a Republican Party that was totally, in essence, beholden to corporate values and money, pulling a very strong populist message out of the bag, and really being anti-corporate on some level. Some of the anti-monopoly type things that are done. Maybe it's more rhetoric than than reality, but I see the corporations playing to very socially conservative views to get people elected who fit their economic interests. I see the Democratic Party playing very heavily towards trying to get business support and actually developing a lot of the more neoliberal policies, deregulation, uh, redistribution over time to win corporate support and losing their working class base where the corporations really are not going to be able to save them. So I see a kind of a funny um, transition point in the role of corporations in the political I think we, I, I guess I would maybe describe it slightly differently. I think we could get to the world that you're talking about, and I agree that some of the trends are in that direction. But I actually think from a policy perspective, corporations have gotten much of what they wanted, particularly from the Republican Party in the last decade. So they got the huge corporate tax cut that they've been asking for for decades under Donald Trump. And by most measures that legal scholars put together, the Roberts Court is the most pro-business court ever, but certainly in at least a century. So when we think about things like Chevron and we think about this, it seems to me that while there are threats to corporate America, and I actually wish corporate America took um, the threats to kind of basic American institutions more seriously than they do. One of the stories I tell in the book are of the, of the corporate moderates, they were actually conservative, um, who tried to convince corporate America to take a different approach in the 40s and 50s and be a little less self-involved and a little more patriotic. And that movement succeeded then. And I wish we had a movement now. So I could imagine we get to a world where corporate America has deep problems. In my reading of it, we're still in a world in which um, corporate America has, has too much power for the well-being of most Americans. Your sense is they don't perceive a destabilization with the polarization. Yes. I don't think corporate America is sufficiently frightened about the problems in American society. Okay, I think that was the last question, and I want to say thank you very much to the uh, debate. Thank you all.